Good evening and welcome to this evening's program. I'm Jeff Spence uh, from the Alumni Relations Office at Thomas Jefferson University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this, our fourth virtual CME program through the Jefferson Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. To kick off our program, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bill Schluff, who is the Paul and Eloise Bowers Professor and Chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Thomas Jefferson University. Dr. Schlaff. I'd like to thank Jeff and Roberta Watson from the OIA, but uh, mostly I really wanna welcome everyone. Uh, this uh, is the fourth of our series of alumni lectures. Uh, we're, we're welcoming back a number of folks who've attended previous uh, uh, programs, uh, welcoming others who have not. Uh, this whole initiative grew out of COVID where two things happened. One, we really felt like we weren't connecting as much uh, internally or externally. Uh, and we, number two, developed a whole new technology around Zoom and distance learning. Uh, and the department really thought that this was an ideal opportunity to marry the two, uh, to use distance learning to provide both CME as well as fellowship to people in our Jefferson family from OBGYN. Uh, it's been my goal to try to continue to cultivate uh, our legacy, our heritage, uh, and to welcome back uh, many folks who were either uh, students or residents or both uh, at Jefferson, uh, and to really try to build uh, an alumni presence that hopefully when all of the pandemic eases, we'll be able to really return uh, to getting together and being together and have a bit more of an extensive foundation. Uh, our previous three speakers were all august, well-known, having been around a zillion and a half years, uh, speakers, Norm Rosenblum, Paul Nergesi, and Vincenzo Bergela. Uh, and that's part of why uh, this evening's uh, speaker is really the most fun to have so far. Uh, Beth Schwartz is a new faculty member, uh, soon to be associate professor, we all know. Uh, and Beth is a graduate of Harvard and of the University of Rochester, but was a resident with us at Jefferson, finished just as I was getting here in 2012. Following residency, she did a fellowship in pediatric and adolescent gynecology at the University of Cincinnati, uh, spent a year on the faculty there, and then succumbed to the siren of returning to Jefferson and to our recruiting efforts, and has headed our, our program in pediatric and adolescent gynecology. Uh, since 2015. Uh, Beth is, uh, I'll let her speak for herself. Uh, I'm sure that her enthusiasm and talent will become quite apparent. And while the other three speakers represent uh, Jefferson past and to some extent Jefferson future, uh, Beth really represents Jefferson future. Uh, and it's great to, to welcome her and to introduce her to uh, our alumni this evening. Her, uh, her topic is Happy as a Lark, Long-acting reversible contraception in adolescence. Beth, you're on. Thank you so much. I am really excited to be here. I did not realize I was following uh, the other three people who were so well established. But um, thanks for letting me be here, and it is really fun to be able to talk um, as both uh, a current obstetrics and gynecology uh, faculty member at Jefferson, but also as an alumna, this is really fun for me. And I also get to talk about a topic that is incredibly near and dear to my heart, um, both clinically on a daily basis and also from a research point of view. So, all right. So happy as a lark, long acting reversible contraception in adolescents. So the objectives of the talk are um, for all of you to be able to counsel patients about uh, both contraceptive benefits of LARC methods, which you are probably very well familiar with, but we're gonna talk a little bit about the non-contraceptive benefits as well. Talk about some of the common LARC side effects and complications and how to manage them with the minimal data we currently have. And then the real meat of the talk is talking about special considerations for their use in adolescent patients and what you might do differently and what you might do exactly the same. 
So whenever we're really talking about this topic, I think the first place to start is well, what do teenagers want in the methods they're choosing? A lot of times we know what we want for them, but what are the things that are important to them? So this was a study um, really looking at, at um, birth control for birth control for contraceptive purposes. And um, adolescents in the UK said that the most important factors were high efficacy. I think we would agree with that. Protection against STIs, which is an interesting one, um, and not interfering with sex in the moment, which is something that we might not think about as much when we're thinking um, about uh, contraceptive choices for teenagers. Interestingly, in this study, something that I think a lot of us do think is an important factor for teenagers is changing menstrual patterns and having irregular periods or perhaps amenorrhea. That was not at all important to them. They correctly identified um, that the advantages of LARCs were that they were reliable, easy, and lasted for a long time. And interestingly, for the implant only, having had friends who had good experiences with these methods uh, influenced teens to want to use it themselves. Barriers to LARC use, which are really big ones to overcome, but thinking about um, talking and counseling patients about this it is really important knowing how um, much of a barrier it is. Fear of pain and needles and having a foreign body, and that's probably something we hear from a lot of our patients. Um, another study looked at adolescents' experiences with uh, choosing IUDs and what made them choose to continue them or discontinue them. Um, and this was uh, a piece out of the Choice Project, which we'll talk about more in a future slide. Um, but things um, were similar to the previous study. Uh, things that made them choose IUDs were how effective they were, how long they lasted, and how convenient they were. Um, potential bleeding changes, which could go either way, as you see in the next slide, is that for patients with with the um, hormonal IUD, bleeding irregularities were highly associated with discontinuation, whereas with copper um, IUDs, bleeding abnormalities of a different sort um, were factors for that. But in terms of choosing IUDs, a lot of the teens wanted amenorrhea. Um, people who chose the copper IUD, they were tended to be patients who really did want regular periods and liked the idea of a non-hormonal method. And similar to our clinical experience, the teens noticed that there's an adjustment period of, quote, weeks to months um, of having some side effects and bleeding irregularities before they saw improvement, which hits home that these are things that we should be telling people about in advance. So LARC efficacy, I think I'm preaching to the choir on this slide. This is looking at um, perfect use, effectiveness, and typical use efficacy. Um, and we really know that the benefit of LARC methods is that um, their perfect and typical use are almost identical. But when I give this talk and show this slide to pediatricians, they are often blown away by it. They know that um, perfect and typical use, for example, for combined OCPs are not equal, but I think they're really, really surprised by how different those numbers are. And so sometimes when they look at this, it really makes them think more about, um, you know, going to their go-to combined OCPs, and it makes them at least counsel a little bit better, I think, um, for LARC methods. Um, so this is data from the Choice Project, which many of you probably are well aware of. It is a um, large project out of St. Louis funded by the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, that looked at about 10,000 women ages 14 to 45 who did not want to be pregnant in the next year and were either not using any contraception currently or were willing to switch methods. They were all given standardized counseling about contraceptive options and the way the counseling was structured was that they talked about it from the most effective methods to the least effective methods. And then after that standardized counseling, uh, subjects were able to pick any option of their choosing and it was given to them free of cost. So when you look at these um, compliance and continuation rates by year, you can see unsurprisingly um, that the continuation for LARC methods at each year is significantly higher than for non-LARC methods and that becomes even more pronounced after one year. A lot of this is really what we would expect, although one of the things I do like to point out from this information is that people um, are even uh, 
less compliant with the vaginal ring and the transdermal patch than they are with OCPs. And I think that that's something that a lot of people don't realize or think about. They think, oh, once a week is easier um, than every day. But it turns out that people are generally even worse at remembering to do that. Um, and then uh, when you uh, look even further out, we only have information beyond three years right now um, for IUDs, but you can see that the pattern of uh, pretty high continuation rate continues over this time. Um, interestingly, um, this is all, uh, this data is all for uh, teenagers ages 14 to 19. So lest you think that this is um, skewed by the adults who are keeping them longer, this data in this table is all all, um, from teens. So they're obviously keeping uh, the long acting methods much longer. Um, and here you can see uh, sort of stratified by adolescents uh, versus adults. Some, pe uh, some people will point out, well, teenagers discontinue LARC methods more than adults do. And that is definitely true, especially as you um, get to the three-year mark, but even more striking is how different um, at every time point the continuation for LARC versus non-LARC methods. So yes, you could argue, well, teens are only using, about half of them are only using their methods at three years. But if you compare that to the fact that only a quarter are using their non-LARC method, that's still a really significant difference. Um, the um, comparison data at four to five years is not clear um, yet because uh, the paper that presents this stratifies um, most of the patient, uh, the total population together at uh, less than 24 months and greater than 24 months. And in um, in the same study, they looked at um, all the patients together, so not broken down by age, but they looked at um, the reasons for discontinuation by method. Unsurprisingly, I think for, um, for the um, IUDs and implant and depo, bleeding changes are the most significant, although it is a lot of people think that it's mostly going to be the um, hormonal IUDs because of the irregular bleeding pattern. But you can see here um, that it's actually far, far higher for the copper IUD because of the potentially worsened and heavier bleeding. Um, so that's the highest reasons for discontinuation. You can see for the short acting methods, logistics. So getting it from the pharmacy, remembering to take it, um, are the highest reasons for discontinuation. And then um, in the copper IUD, unsurprisingly, that has the lowest rate of not liking the side effects and the side effects being a reason for discontinuation. So let's talk a little about each method. Um, so uh, implantable contraception, what is currently on the market is Nexplanon, which is an etanogestrel implant. Etanogestrel is an active metabolite of the progestin um, desogestrel. What I tell a lot of people is this is not your mama's nor plant because a lot of my patients come in with not just what they've heard from their friends, but also with their parents and a lot of their mother's lived experiences or the, the myths and rumors that they've heard. And these days, um, scary enough, a lot of times it's um, my patient's grandparents who have had some of these experiences with some of these prior methods. Um, Norplant, um, for any of you who were not um, around when it was being used, it um, came in onto the market in the United States in 1990. It was six rods with leave and adjustral. They lasted five years. And the biggest complaint from providers were that um, they were pretty difficult to remove. It took an average time of 18 minutes plus or minus 10 minutes to um, remove them. They were taken off the market in 2002 and then Implanon became FDA approved uh, for this indication in 2006. It was one rod containing etanogestrel. It lasted three years and the removal time because it was only one rod was an average of six minutes with a standard deviation of 3.4 minutes. So much, much quicker to remove. Uh, Nexplanon is the same as Implanon. It was phased in um, a few years later. The only two differences between Implanon and Nexplanon was that uh, the inserter for the current Nexplanon is far easier than the inserter was for Implanon, which um, some people argued allowed for deeper placements that um, required more um, 
more intervention for removal. And also uh, the current next one on is radio opaqueness, and you can see it on an X-ray, which is sometimes helpful for locating it um, if you can't palpate it. Um, so it is, it's a single four centimeter radio opaque rod. It lasts for three years officially. That is what is approved um, for by the FDA. However, extended use studies um, have followed it out to five years and have found no pregnancies that occurred in about 300 women followed out to that point potentially even more important than that is that at that point, the median um, serum eatonogestrel levels were high enough to still be suppressing ovulation at that stage. However, something that um, is important to know for providers is that after about the first six months, although it consistently suppresses ovulation, it does not necessarily suppress follicular genesis. So you may still see dominant follicles or follicular cysts in this population, um, but that should not raise your concern that it is not preventing um, ovulation. Um, and in addition uh, to suppressing ovulation, it also, as all progestin-only methods, it increases the thickness of cervical mucus, making it harder for sperm to penetrate, and then thins the endometrium um, and atrophies, it making it a less desirable place for a pregnancy to implant. One of the benefits of it is that it is very, very rapidly reversible. Return to fertility is reported to be within seven days of removal. And sometimes when, not usually my patients, but when their parents have a lot of concerns about, well, will this prevent them from being able to get pregnant in the future? I share a recent study that mentioned that the return to fertility after all of the different methods was quickest after removal of Nexplanon, then IUDs, then OCPs, and then last um, Depo-Provera injections. And I think that that provides some reassurance that the LARC methods do not, um, even though they last longer, they do not last longer once they are removed. Non-contraceptive benefits of uh, the implant is um, improved bleeding in some people. So when you look at the statistics of bleeding patterns with Nexplanon, about 22% become amenorrheic. Um, about a third have less frequent periods. There is also improved pain associated uh, with menses and reduced pain um, due to endometriosis. However, on the flip side, we'll talk about bleeding in a second. Um, there are some patients who will anecdotally report that it may worsen depression, especially in, in patients who are already prone to it. Again, may worsen hormonal acne in people who are prone to it because it's just a systemic progestin, occasionally headaches. Many patients will complain of weight gain. Um, however, objective data shows that there is no difference um, in weight at a year versus IUDs. And the benefit of this over Depo-Provera is that there is not an impact on bone density, even if the impact on bone density we know now to be reversible on Depo. Irregular bleeding is probably the most common one. Um, about 40% of patients may report some sort of irregular or breakthrough bleeding. What that means is different to everyone and what type of breakthrough bleeding you have is really, I think, what determines how annoyed you are by it. Frequent and prolonged irregular bleeding is much, likely, much more likely to cause annoyance than infrequent bleeding. And so what I usually tell people when I give it to them is, you know, if I give it to five people, of those five people, one would be amenorrheic, two would have their regular periods but improved, and two would have irregular bleeding, but not all irregular bleeding is created equal. If you have three days of bleeding every three months, you will probably be happy. If you have two to three weeks of bleeding every month, you will probably not be happy. Um, at least one study has shown that the bleeding pattern at three months is predictive of future bleeding patterns. So I strongly encourage all of my patients to continue it for at least three months and attempt some sort of intervention if there is bothersome irregular bleeding. And then if they really still hate it at that point, um, can consider removing it. In studies of reasons for discontinuation, the most common reason for discontinuation was due to bleeding irregularities, although the majority of patients did not report that they had this. I will say this is um, from some outside studies, the Merck package insult or insert um, 
uh, in terms of the other um, side effects other than bleeding reports 6% emotional lability, 2% acne, 3% weight gain. I think that many of us anecdotally have seen more than that. IUDs. So here's the biggest issue. It's much easier to convince a teenager into getting an arm implant than it is to doing an IUD. And part of the reason we'll talk about later is fear of pain. But one of the reasons is that IUDs seem kind of terrifying and they definitely seem terrifying to a lot of their parents who will bring up, well, aren't IUDs bad and don't they cause infertility? And where did that come from? That came from this kind of terrifying looking thing to me called the Dalcon Shield, which was the um, main IUD present in the United States in the 1970s. Although I was interested to find out that um, modern day IUDs have actually been marketed since 1909. So the Dalcon Shield definitely wasn't the first one on the market, but it was for sure the one that gave IUDs a bad name. So it was on the market in the 70s. And as you can see here, it had this broad body with lateral spikes with the rationale that those lateral spikes prevented expulsion. It had a multi-filament tail, which you can um, see here. The problem is that these um, features caused harboring of bacteria and the facilitation of an ascending, of ascending infection. So it was almost like this um, multi-filament tail was like a ladder for bacteria to climb. And this lovely curved body with the spikes um, was really uh, just sitting there as sort of a petri dish for bacteria. What this resulted in was in addition to infectious risk, it resulted in higher contraceptive failures, fivefold increased risks of PID um, and septic abortion. So because of this, the manufacturer halted production pretty quickly in 1974. And then um, in 1980, the manufacturer recommended removal of IUDs even from asymptomatic women due to the risk of actinomyces infection. And then in 1983, the FDA recommended removal from all women. Um, however, it's important to note, and I sometimes tell my patients this, although that was the case with this particular IUD, there was never any changes for any other um, IUD um, on the market, either by the manufacturer or by the FDA. And there were five others on the market at that time. However, due to bad press and litigation related to this IUD, almost all IUDs were removed from the market by 1986. What I try to sell some of my nervous patients on is that everything bad that happened from this IUD, um, pharmaceutical companies have used this information to create much, much better and safer IUDs. Um, so current IUDs have this thin, flexible frame, no lateral spikes, and it has a monofilament tail, which has both made them safer and also more efficacious for contraception. Um, there are five IUDs currently on the market. The one and only um, non-hormonal IUD, the copper IUD, is marketed under the brand name Paragard. It is made out of plastic wrap with copper wire. It lasts officially FDA approved for 10 years. There's data um, showing efficacy up to 12. And the way it works is that um, inhibits sperm um, from being viable and from moving as quickly. It changes the speed of the egg moving through the fallopian tube. It may damage or destroy the egg itself, but it's important to note that effects occur before impl um, implantation, which is reassuring for some patients. This is also the most effective method of emergency contraception. It is definitely not considered as much as it should be, but if you are ever seeing a patient who has had recent unprotected intercourse and is interested in an IUD anyway, um, an IUD is a great option. However, I will present some um, recent data that it doesn't necessarily have to just be um, a paragard IUD anymore. Even a gestural IUDs, um, there are four currently on the market. Um, Mirena is the one that's been around longest. It was approved for five years for a long time. As of August of this, as of sometime last year, it was approved for six years, competing with Bileta. As of August of this year, it is now officially approved for seven years, which is really exciting. And I love getting to tell patients that information. There's also um, three um, other IUDs on the market. Um, Skyla, uh, which is uh, three years and really only good for three years. It is smaller and has less hormonal content. 
Kylina, which is about, um, which is the same size as Skyla, but has slightly more hormonal content and it truly lasts for five years and only five years. And then Lyletta, which is, um, has uh, the same dose as Mirena, although it releases a slightly lower uh, concentration um, of levonorgestrel daily. I'll show you a chart in a minute. That is currently approved for six years. We know it will be approved for seven years. And that's really why Marina got approved for longer is because they knew that Lyletta was getting um, these uh, approvals for longer and they wanted to be able to compete. The way um, that uh, these IUDs work is they do some of the same things that um, copper IUDs do, um, but they also decrease endometrial proliferation, um, which is what part of um, what leads to their major non-contraceptive benefits. It also thickens cervical mucus, decreases tubal motility. It, however, does not consistently suppress ovulation. It suppresses it in about 35% um, of patients, but the majority of patients still ovulate and that um, the percentage of patients who ovulate increase over time. So for patients who have cyclic um, hormonal symptoms, they still may want this, but I think that they need to be counseled that this is unlikely to help their um, PMS symptoms or their menstrual migraines, and that should be taken um, into account. I do have to mention that we are sort of using some of these off-label um, in younger patients. Paragard and Liletta are both FDA approved for patients 16 and older. All of the Bayer products are um, approved for patients 18 and older with a statement that is interesting to me. It is, and I quote, efficacy is expected to be the same for postpubertal females under the age of 18 as for users 18 and older. Use of this product before menarche is not indicated. So they um, are certainly not saying that it can't be used, but they have not tested their products on any patients under 18. Um, and then, um, you know, one of the, I think, major benefits of um, the IUD and something that we can really sell a lot of patients on is that almost all of the um, effects are local. There's very, very little um, systemic absorption. Um, a plasma level steady states of um, 100 to 200 picograms per milliliter, which is one tenth of the levels of levonorgestrel in OCPs. Because so little is absorbed, there's really minimal side effects or interactions with any other medications um, or medical problems. Um, some women do report headaches, nausea, breast tenderness, uh, worsened moods, and ovarian cyst formation, although that's one that has somehow gotten out there into the media. And it's important to note that um, ovarian cyst formation in, in this group is no higher than the women who don't have IUDs. So non-contraceptive benefits for the copper IUD, there really aren't any. For the hormonal IUDs and particularly for the higher dose hormonal IUDs, so Mirena and Liletta, there is a significant reduction in overall bleeding in some studies up to 97% at one year. So not instantly, but by one year of use, almost everybody has much, much lighter bleeding. Many people have amenorrhea. The package insert um, says that only 20% of patients have amenorrhea at one year. Interestingly, the package insert has recently been updated and includes a 28% amenorrhea rate at um, seven years, which um, is interesting that it, it's more at that time, although um, I have not seen the direct data for that, and I'm sure there's at least some selection bias. In many research studies, um, including some of the data of mine that I'll present later, um, it's up to around 50% um, at one year, so higher than um, in the official uh, Bayer data. There's also been found to be improvements in dysmenorrhea, chronic pelvic pain, and uh, you know, symptoms related to endometriosis. And IUDs can be used um, either to prevent or um, help treat early endometrial hyperplasia um, for patients who are not able to or who do not want to undergo definitive treatment. But what about side effects? So for copper IUDs, we know in about two thirds of patients, um, increased bleeding and cramping is reported. 
In many of these patients, that decreases back to baseline levels by around six months. So again, I encourage people to give it um, at least six months in this case to see if things are improved. And I counsel people extensively in advance about um, the possibility of this. And some people are fine with that because they have light regular, not painful periods. Other people say, please don't do anything to mess with my wonderful three-day periods. I don't want anything that could make them any worse. With hormonal IUDs, um, there are changes in bleeding pattern that for some people is a benefit, but for some people is a downside. I counsel everybody that they are almost definitely going to have some irregular, um, unpredictable initial bleeding. Um, again, the um, official uh, data is 15% at three months. The higher, um, because uh, Skyline and Kylina have lower hormonal contents, those irregular bleeding rates um, are definitely higher for those both initially and over um, the long term. But the initial irregular bleeding and cramping improves with time. What I tell all of my patients is that the first three to six months with an IUD may be a love-hate relationship, but I will do everything in my power to try to get you over that six-month hump, because if I can get you to the other side of it, it is usually all love after that. And of all the things I say to them, that one line does seem to stick with people a lot, and they remember it and sometimes parrot it back to me when I see them back. Um, this is a chart looking at the four um, hormonal IUDs that are on the market and the differences between them. Um, you know, one of the major differences we talked about is sort of the, the daily dosage, but also the amenorrhea rates. Um, it's really hard to find official data on some of these things. The amenorrhea rate is um, the most consistent one we have. Um, the amenorrhea rate, um, I always mention, and why I never use Skyla, the amenorrhea rate in one year is 6%, um, and it's only 12%, even in its full duration of use. So um, I, uh, for most of my patients who are getting it because they want improved periods or potentially no period, that's not good enough. Now, many of you may say, but don't we need to use Skylight and Kylina in our younger patients because they're smaller? Well, they are smaller, but if you look at this, they are really minimally smaller. We are talking um, two millimeters in um, width and four millimeters in um, length. In my whole career, I never, I've never, I've never placed either a Skyla or Kylina. And in my whole career, I've had um, a, a Mirena or a Lila to not fit in a single patient ever. I think she was 11. I've put them in patients as young as nine. Once patients are monarchal, their uterus is large enough to fit an IUD. So I, I choose the one that is based um, on what kind of bleeding pattern they want and the duration of use that they want. And to me, especially Skyla, um, it's not worth the process. Timing of insertion. So um, we really say anytime pregnancy can be reasonably excluded, we used to say that if anybody had had um, unprotected intercourse in the past two weeks that we were not able to put it um, in and we would bring people back. This is kind of exciting is um, a recent study um, was published this year in uh, the New England Journal um, looking at using, it was a non-inferiority study looking at um, copper versus levonorgestrel IUD, specifically Lyletta for emergency contraception. And this was exciting for two reasons. Number one, um, this was not um, intended to prove which one was better, but they concluded that Lyletta was not inferior to the copper IUD. So if you have a patient who wants an IUD and, would perf and has bad periods, you can use a high dose hormonal IUD for emergency contraception in these patients. The other thing that was exciting about this study is um, when, um, IUDs were being inserted, we usually either um, recommended it either within five days after unprotected intercourse or using it not as emergency contraception and it had to be at least two weeks after intercourse. This study did not include patients if they ha um, had had intercourse um, farther apart, um, farther sort of between those times. So more than five days, but less than two weeks. Um, as long as they had a negative urine pregnancy test at the time of insertion, and they had only one pregnancy in the entire um, group, it wasn't the Lyletta group, but they did not see significant increased um, 
risk. So I think if you have a patient, especially if you have a patient who is higher risk for not returning for, um, for pregnancy, I think that this gives us um, some backup to say that we can really increase uh, it. Um, insert this at any time during the cycle, as long as we know that they are not pregnant at that time. Complications of IUD insertion. So there's lots of different ones, most of which um, are either expected or really minimal. So patients with pain, bleeding, vasovagal reaction, which can um, be as simple as feeling a little lightheaded, dizzy, nausea, um, feeling a little sweaty. I've had multiple patients syncopies during or immediately after their IUD insertion. Um, difficulty with insertion, you could argue that that's a complication, um, but the real complications that we're usually thinking about are in the right column. So perforation, um, which uh, the rates of perforation are 1.6 in a thousand for non-actively breastfeeding women, it's 1.3 in a thousand, so quite low. Um, and what I would, really take away from the slide is that complications are really, really rare. We know that the risk of perforation decreases with increasing experience. Of course, that's hard when um, we know that we need to teach our um, residents and, and fellows to be able to place these, but um, you know, we can also reassure people that if we're um, there and supervising that really these rates are very, very low in general. Um, I'll skip the rest. Side effects. This is probably the biggest one. So irregular bleeding for any of the LARC options is the biggest source of annoyance, frustration, and discontinuation. I think this all starts with the pre-procedure counseling. So I spend a long time counseling my patients about what to expect, what could happen, um, and being really realistic about it. So I told you, you know, how I talk about Nexplanon, you know, one person will have this, two people will have this, two people will have this. You may have bleeding for weeks at a time. With IUDs, I never say to patients, you're going to get this and you are going to be amenorrheic. I say there is a chance. I said, there's about a 50-50 chance that by a year, you will stop getting your period. If you don't stop getting your period, you will likely have either light regular or light irregular periods, but I never oversell um, something and I never um, also, uh, you know, falsely reassure people um, about the things that they may or may not have. When they do have irregular bleeding, reassurance is really, really important. So I have found that a lot of my patients are annoyed and just don't like the bleeding. A lot of my patients are worried that it means that it's not working for birth control. And so I reassure them that, nope, this is really common. This happens to a ton of people. Here's what we can expect. Here's what we can do, but this is still working for birth control. And then if we do intervene, there's a lot of different things that we can do. There are really almost no data on any of these different options. And part of it depends um, what their goals are. So if they have a re a initial irregular bleeding, I know that a lot of people will go to estrogen. Estrogen will thicken and stabilize the endometrium, but at some point that endometrium is still going to need to bleed. So I do not ever use estrogen um, to stop bleeding. I am much, much more likely to use um, norethindrone acetate or agestin um, because it acutely stabilizes the endometrium um, likely because there's a small amount of conversion um, to ethanol estradiol, but then over time, it causes a decidualized reaction and atrophies um, the lining of the uterus. So I will often give people a 30-day course of that. For patients who, for example, already have acne and don't want something that can worsen acne, then maybe I'll use um, a few months of OCPs if they don't have contraindications. Some people have used tranexamic acid. Um, there was a recent study in the last year or two about using um, tamoxifen to help with irregular um, bleeding from Nexplanon. There um, is one study that has shown um, efficacy of using a combination for um, breakthrough bleeding with Nexplanon of doxycycline and mifepristone. Um, but some of those are a little bit hard cells and were also not tested in adolescence. I will also sometimes um, empirically treat for endometritis, especially if people have any um, discomfort on um, abdominal or pelvic exam. 
um, for immediate uh, post-procedure IUD pain. I tell everybody to take unless they have contraindications, round the clock and said use for the first two to three days and then if needed after that. And then I do pe bring people back in um, actually for both Nexplanons and IUDs um, for IUD checks or Nexplanon checks, never string checks. I'm checking globally how things are working. Um, for IUD checks, I will um, do an exam to make sure that the IUD is properly um, positioned on exam. Um, for some of our patients, um, and I'll talk about special populations, they're not able to tolerate pelvic exams and they're patients that I have potentially put in um, in the operating room. If I'm concerned about possible um, malposition and they can't or are not able to tolerate an exam, we can also get an ultrasound to check position. So to bring it home, let's talk about special concerns in adolescents. So the CDC medical eligibility criteria for contraceptive use lists um, all IUDs as category two in patients under 20. Category two means um, benefits typically outweigh risks, but it's not category one full steam ahead. Well, why is that? It's because there's these theoretical risks of expulsion and really PID in this population, but is that really warranted? So we looked at the continuation rates um, in earlier slides uh, for LARCs as a whole. This looked at it a little bit differently in a way that I thought was really interesting. So this was a study looking at age par and parity groups. So the continuation rate was really high in all groups. And what they found was that there were not any differences by patient age. The difference was in parity. So nulliparous patients were more likely to discontinue the copper IUD and implant, although even given that, about two-thirds of them were still using it at two years. And interestingly, there was no difference um, in uh, hormonal IUD discontinuation rates. So it may not be purely an age thing um, the way we usually talk about it. PID is the biggest one that people talk about, and with good reason. Teenagers get PID and women in their early 20s get PID because they get more STDs. So all of the sexually transmitted infections in the U.S., of all of them, half of them are in women under 25, which is what drives the CDC's recommendation um, for annual screening um, for all women under 25 for, sex, uh, for sexually transmitted infections. We also know that LARC users has poor condom use, and this was one of the big um, concerns when LARC methods came out is they said, well, you know, people aren't going to be protecting against infections because they have these really um, effective contraceptive methods. Well, it turns out, yeah, they do have poor condom use, but also they had worse condom use before they got LARC methods, which is probably one of the reasons that they chose it is they knew that it was easier and more reliable. Um, LARC users are more likely to have an STI in the first um, 12 months um, and more likely in younger women. But again, that's due to patient selection rather than the method themselves. In practice, however, the risk of PID is very low and is less than 1%. It happened um, due to IUDs only in the first 20 days after insertion. After that, there's actually decreased um, rates of PID, likely because of the decreased tubal motility. I never tell my patients that last fact. Um, and really the patients that um, we're worried about are people who have active infections at the time of IUD insertion that are not recognized and not treated. So I screen everyone at the time of IUD insertion, even if they tell me that they are not sexually active, sometimes people don't tell you the truth, or even if they say they haven't been for a while or they're in a monogamous relationship, I tell them my rule is that I do a swab for every single person before I put something in their uterus and then follow up um, that swab. And if there is any um, infection, treat it promptly. Um, and then of course, we should always be encouraging our patients to consistently use condoms to prevent infection. Expulsion. So this was another major concern because early data um, on this showed a significantly increased risk. Everyone quoted this one study that showed up to a 22% increased um, risk of expulsion in the leprous patients, but that all of these studies have been really plagued by very, very small numbers. And the, they weren't necessarily specific to adolescents, they were more um, for nulliparous patients. 
as we have more data, this does not seem to hold up. Almost all evidence now shows that there's no difference um, in expulsion rates between um, either by age or by parity. And then the big thing is the insertion process. So technical difficulty for um, the provider and difficulty for the patient. By far, this is the biggest barrier to IUD insertion. Even in patients who come in wanting it, they don't quite realize how that necessarily gets there. So some things to think about. First of all, do we need a pre-procedure ultrasound? So a lot of times people will say, well, um, you know, patients who are really young or patients who are within a few years of menarche or who are petite um, or in a wheelchair, um, they, they really need pre-op ultrasounds. Um, there's very, very little data on this, but the data that we do have suggests that this is not necessary and does not improve success of the procedure. I do not ever do a pre-procedure ultrasound. Um, what about special techniques? So a lot of people will use mesoprostol. Um, we know in one RCT that not only does it not um, improve things, it actually worsens cramping and pain. And it was given in a, um, a double blind RCT and both um, uh, patients actually had more pain in the mesoprostol group and providers did not rate the insertion as any easier. Um, I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend something I uh, recently heard called for pivot for ver Bivacaine, which is verbal reassurance, talking people through. I um, really um, clearly talk through the procedure in advance um, and then while I'm doing it. And then I encourage people to do anything that is going to relax them, whether that is holding someone's hand, having a parent in the room, kicking their parent out sometimes makes them feel more comfortable, listening to music, watching things on TikTok doing anything that will just chill them out a little bit, um, I think is really, really helpful. Um, uh, a study um, a few years ago by Akers um, from CHOP looked at satisfaction with IUD insertion um, in nulliparous uh, teens and young adults. Um, Three quarters of patients um, reported high satisfaction, most recommended it to a friend, and most said the IUD was worth it, although they noted lower, lower satisfaction in patients who are younger who had not had a prior GU exam and those who had more pain, which is unsurprising. However, I'd like to point out that satisfaction was high for most people. Um, for patients who are not sure whether they might be able to do it, I strongly recommend a practice speculum exam. So, hey, let's see if you can do this. If you can do this, I really think you'll be able to, to get an IUD. And for some patients who are really nervous, thinking about giving, um, you know, a low dose of Ativan or something, I tell them it's not going to make the procedure feel any different, but it might just help get them in the door and just relax a little more. In terms of pain, really the experience is very, very variable. Um, one study showed that the expectation of pain influences perception of it. We know that NSAIDs do not help with procedural pain. However, it does help with post-procedure pain. So I strongly recommend um, that everyone take NSAIDs before the procedure. Um, and maybe there's a little bit of a placebo effect. And then um, Akers, um, as part of that same study, also um, did uh, 10 milliliters, 1% lidocaine power circle blocks in a really cool um, double-blinded RCT. They took the back of um, a Q-tip swab and, and pushed it. Um, on the areas where you would give a paracervical box. So patients really did not um, know what they were getting. And unsurprisingly, at every step along the procedure, patients who got the, the, pars the real paracervical block had less pain, except with speculum placement because there was no pain reduction for that. Um, oh, I do... Uh, there are a lot of people who I know routinely give paracervical blocks for all the liparous patients, all patients. I, I don't. I really do a lot of shared decision making with my patients. I will offer it for some patients who are really nervous or who vasovagal with things or who um, note that they have uh, bad uh, pain problems or have had a really painful IUD insertion or attempt in the past. I do not routinely do it because it makes the whole procedure take longer. And when I talk to people about it, they say that the, the best thing that they want is for it to be over quickly. So I will do it for select people, but I don't routinely do it. 
And then lastly, well, what about other people who would benefit from IUDs, but who we don't necessarily think of as being traditional candidates? So mostly for people who want it for contraception in the future, but have never been sexually active, people who want it for um, medical indications, and um, patients with disabilities. So um, a former resident and I did the study a few years ago, she is now a full Pete's Gyne at a fellowship, um, looked at uh, the insertion procedure in patients who were never sexually active versus sexually active. Um, there was no success, um, difference in um, success on the first attempts. However, it should be noted that about half of the patients um, who were not sexually active had IUDs placed under anesthesia. Some of them were at the time of other procedures, but others were because they were too nervous for office insertion. When we looked separately at the subset of all the patients who had it done in the office, um, patients who were never sexually active were more likely to have unsuccessful IUD insertions. Although I would like to point out that 84% of those were still um, successful and they were more less likely to tolerate the procedure well, but again, 81% tolerated it well. Overall, in both groups, the success rate and the tolerance were very high. Um, uh, in uh, the Journal of Adolescent Health, I published last year um, a study on looking at um, hormonal IUD use in over 200 patients um, whose primary indication for using an IUD was medical, so for heavy bleeding um, dysmenorrhea, endometriosis. Um, mean age was almost 17, only 40% had ever been sexually active. Continuation rate at um, a year was 86%. The amenorrhea rate was 50%. And 80% of uh, patients reported improvement in bleeding and abdominal and pelvic pain. And the side effects and complication rates were very, very low. And then lastly, um, a group that um, I think needs more consideration for a lot of um, reasons is women with disabilities. So um, puberty and periods are a huge source of anxiety and concern for these families for a variety of reasons. There's a lot of concern that, well, who's gonna help them with menstrual hygiene um, when they're at school or um, girls with autism who are smearing feces on the wall are also gonna smear blood on the wall or not be able um, to tolerate the sensory issues of pads. And so there, um, I see a lot of these patients for um, counseling before periods even start because they want a game plan in place about what they're gonna do. And believe it or not, um, it's a surprise to a lot of people, but a lot of people opt um, to get IUDs, sometimes even as their first ever option. So we reported on almost 200 um, patients with disabilities. Um, only 4% had ever been sexually active. Um, almost all got their IUDs placed in the operating room, all, many at the times of other procedures. Um, other procedures um, were most commonly dental and ENT, so sedated um, dental cleanings or procedures. Um, Almost a fifth were within the first year after menarche, and a third chose an IUD as their first ever method. You can see a Kaplan-Meier survival curve of continuation rates over time. They were very, very high. You can see a sharp drop off after five years because this was a while ago, although there were some patients using them longer. Amenorrhea rates were around 60% in this group, and side effects and complications combined were less than 3%. So take home message in teens, high success rates, high tolerance of insertion for patients who've never had a GYN exam before, consider doing a practice speculum insertion. And for people who can't tolerate a speculum, who won't even let you try, um, but really think an IUD would be the best option for them, consider sedation. You do get reimbursed for sedation for these patients. Um, I can only think of one patient whose IUD insertion was not uh, covered, and I believe we successfully lobbied it, and especially if, if they're getting another exam or procedure. Um, I have done IUDs everywhere you can imagine, cardiac cath lab, the time of hip surgery, uh, plenty of dental cleanings, plenty of other things. My patients know if they're going under anesthesia for any reason, they call and we'll figure out a way to make it happen. And that's it. I think I went longer than my 30 minute allotment, but I would be um, happy to answer 
any questions either out loud or if you wanna put them in the chat. And thank you so much, Dr. Schwartz. This was a, a very informative presentation and program and I hope that everyone um, learned a lot. You can use the chat function to share questions or you can feel free to unmute and, or turn your camera on and share your questions uh, with Dr. Schwartz. While, the, while questions might be formulating, I do want to suggest everyone check the, the chat. Uh, Jeff and Roberta have left us a note uh, that reinforces how to get CME credits. The uh, CME credits are uh, have been arranged by the department uh, with the Office of CME, so there's no cost uh, for our alumni family. Um, uh, if you do have any, uh, any challenges, uh, uh, with getting the CMEs or things don't work so well, I'll contact uh, Jeff by uh, email and he will somehow figure it out for you. Uh, the other thing I wanna say before we uh, get to any questions that there might be, is there was a wonderful picture of, of Snowmass, uh, Colorado, uh, that uh, highlighted the uh, annual uh, alumni meeting at Snowmass. Um, it's a lovely, lovely place to go. You can fly into Aspen, you can find a bunch of other places. Um, so, uh, I would encourage anyone who hasn't ever been to Colorado, um, that it would be a great place to go, uh, for a meeting. So, um, um Beth, good. I have a question. Um, so that was a great talk. I, I guess the question I had for you is, um, you spent the bulk of your time talking about IUDs and, um, is it because you have a preference of IUDs over next one on, or is it just because there's been so much research on IUDs that there's more to talk about on the subject? Um, yeah, I mean, the, well, the reason I've done research on IUDs is because I like them better. Um, my bias is I don't love Nexplanon, um, for two reasons. Now, if somebody walks into my office and says, I want super effective birth control and I don't care about bleeding or side effects then I think Nexplanon is a great option. I find that I have so um, many patients who complain mostly about the irregular bleeding and I spend so much time managing it that I think they really um, don't end up liking it. And my anecdotal experience, I've looked for data and there's nothing out there to back it up, is I think that after patients are not satisfied with almost every other method, if they wanna stop it, I think they're willing to switch to something else Anecdotally, what I think I hear when people don't like Nexplanon is I want this out and I need to give my body a break. I don't want any other hormones. I do not want any other contraception. And then I think they all get rebound pregnancies. So yeah. I, I think they're less likely to start something else. Whereas I think if people don't like one of the other methods, they'll try other things. So I definitely do have a bias. A, against it more. But that said, if a patient wants it, I will absolutely use it. I will manage um, any bleeding or side effects that they have, but I think that that the rates are high. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Um, just as an FYI, um, I, I wouldn't mind touching on a couple of other contraceptive options in the pipeline. So one of them is a copper containing IUD that uh, these are all being developed through the, uh, the contraceptive development program at NIH. Uh, they are testing a copper IUD that's called the mini something, which uh, looks quite like a, uh, uh, the present Paragard, but is uh, smaller and is, uh, has the same amount of copper. So uh, that may be in your armamentarium it's probably going to be in testing soon. Um, on the subject of real changes in contraception, uh, they are soon, I think, going to start a phase three trial of nest test, which is nestosterone, uh, uh, which is a uh, androgenic gel, um, or is an androgenic uh, uh, is a progestogenic gel with an androgen, uh, which men will apply to the back of each of their shoulders, a meter dose, rub one on one shoulder on the other shoulder. And preliminary data show that there's a 
very, very high level of suppression of sperm counts to less than 1 million per ml. Uh, typically takes about uh, six to eight weeks uh, with return of sperm about six to eight weeks after discontinuation uh, and no adverse symptoms. So this could be the first viable male contraceptive. Um, and it's pretty interesting. I would guess that this is going to be in uh, clinical testing. It's already been through phase two trials. So uh, this may be coming around the, the block soon. Uh, the other one I want to mention is uh, a new form of levonorgestrel. It's a levonorgestrel butanoate, which is a, a, an injectable medication uh, a la Depo-Provera, though it is a long-acting progestin, uh, which has none of the Depo-Provera uh, progestogenic side effects. Um, and this may be a particularly attractive uh, approach for those who are socioeconomically uh, less fortunate because IUDs are going to be expensive. Uh, Nest tests I'm not sure about, uh, but this is destined, it is anticipated to be far less expensive uh, available much more broadly, both in this country and other countries. Um, not sure that it's going to be uh, necessarily the meds we use and uh, or approaches we use in adolescence. But, you know, on the subject of contraception, here are some options that are evolving. Yes. I've also heard some, some chatter um, that Bayer, I think, is looking, you know, because their most recent one is going to go off patent, that I think that they are looking um, to use an IUD that may um, have a little bit of um, NSAID embedded in it uh, that is anticipated to work for the first six months or so that may be beneficial or maybe a marketing ploy. Who knows? 